give you now this time in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, Mr. Brent, all yours. I think you get a little bit easier, but uh, not yet. <laughs> So we'll just do a brief recap going all the way back. We covered a lot, so I'm going to condense a little bit, just kind of give a synopsis of what we went through the first, uh, the first week. So with the first week, we kind of focused a little bit to start with what is the story in the Old Testament and the I guess the important mindset of how we approach Genesis as whether we're approaching it um, as literal or um, the many other ways we'll probably discuss a little bit later. Interestingly enough, and I wish I was a little bit better at <laughs> I don't know where it is. Okay. Well, I mean, it's important, so. Okay. <laughs> so, I guess it's, uh, it's funny because I was going to start a, a story. I'm not a super storyteller, I guess. Maybe I just don't find myself that interesting or uh, I'm not sure. But uh, earlier this week, we were going... So we're doing multiple studies. I'm studying the, the history of Genesis and this one, and we are doing Mark as a family. And we got into, so we were on Mark 630, and we had just read Jesus uh, feeds the thousand, and we got to Jesus walking on the water and how the disciples were afraid and how they didn't, we got to the passage in 650 that mentioned, take heart, it is I, do not be afraid. And they said, and they were ast utterly astounded for they did not understand about the loaves. So the kids had some questions about that. It's not so much about Mark 630, this, this, uh, this story, but I found it interesting because we got into the fact that Jesus uh, was walking on water. The fact that he was feeding the 5,000. We almost, even even my children, as we're reading through that, almost just kind of accept that that Jesus did those things. Uh, I think to almost a point, we don't even really think that they're miraculous. You know, yes, he fed 5,000 people. Yes, he walks on water. And it was interesting once we kind of got into it and who Jesus Christ was when we got onto the topic of Genesis and the creation that Jesus was from be the you know the foundations that he was before time that he was the one that created everything the universe uh, the you know we, we went through just just everything that he has created and there was almost a uh, if you could have seen it more of like a connection and an awe a reverence to to where we don't really think about Christ doing these miracles but that he was you know, responsible for so much more that he's so much greater than we really, we really even think. And, and even then we still, uh, we don't understand. So it kind of led into what we went through in the very first week about the importance of how we view Genesis and that it's a historical account, that that is how God created the earth. And he, he, he led us into that information to really see what what went on that we would never have gotten otherwise that we can't see that he has to reveal through his word. So, as a test, because I'm just curious, what is the time period before the flood? What is the what is the uh, the name? We went over this like last two weeks. I wonder if anybody remembered. Yes, it does have a T in it. Right. Well, it's a fun word. I, I, I find it fun to say. So, 
Does anybody remember? Anybody? Starts with an A? It's Latin. <laughs> All right, we're going to get it this week. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to, if you, if you I want. Oh. Yeah. So you want to say it? Sure, but I want, like, I'm going to ask this next week, so it's going to be on the quiz. So go ahead. Yes. Yes. <laughs> Meaning a flood, just before flood. It's a fun way of saying before the flood. So you say the antediluvian uh, period, and people, you know, think you're now an expert at it. No, no, they're not. I, I, I'm not an expert, but I think so. <coughs> right. So if I was teaching that to someone else, I probably wouldn't do that. No, know. no, but well, I, I guess it, flood. yes. But I mean, I guess the argument is, is that I, I, I enjoy words as right. well, right. so. Right, but it might not be something you would. No, you know, you would, that's not how you would start off, I mean, unless that's what your mission. So getting back, just that it's, uh, the synopsis that it actually is the genealogy, and you kind of, it's still amazing to look at that, that, you know, those people all the way to Noah, that was the whole, the whole thing, that we could have just that few people in that, that much time, that they, that still amazes me. And so we have to be careful, the whole thing was the metaphors and everything that we had, that if you try to reclassify Genesis as a, a metaphor or as, you know, just an allegory or some other form of thing, I, I feel like you miss out on a lot. So that's why we started off on the first periods, because I think how you go into it makes, makes a difference. So we looked at uh, all mankind being represented in Adam, saints, sinners, the godly, and the wicked, that it's a story of civilization, society, of culture. And if we remember from last time, when we looked at that in Genesis 3.21, that Adam and Eve were redeemed. So we're looking at a, a first for many things. So it was the first birth, family, sibling, and the disaster. Uh, we remember that it was, he was the first rep reprobate, first unbeliever, first crime, uh, hypocrisy, religion, self-righteousness. I mean, it's funny, those, he, was, he was racking them up. That's well, not really what you want to be well known for, but well. And of course, uh, finishing up, our first one is just that we need to remember that it's not a matter of biological process, that it's God who gives life and who places the soul. So in the second week, we, got, we came to, um, the worship aspect. So just to read it real quick to kind of give myself and you a refresher. Abel was a keeper of flocks, but Cain was a tiller of the ground. So it came about in the course of time that Cain brought an offering to the Lord of the fruit of the ground. Abel, on his part, also brought out the firstlings of the flock of their fat portions, and the Lord had regard for Abel for his offerings, but for Cain and for his offering, he had no regard. And then we also talk, we went further. So Cain became very angry, and his countenance fell. Then the Lord said to Cain, Why are you angry, and why has your countenance fallen? If you do well, will, you, will not your countenance be lifted up and if you do not do well, sin is crouching at the door, and its desire is for you. 
but you must master it. So we looked at a few characteristics, and this is quite the, the summary too, so you know it's, it's not exhaustive from last week. If anybody has any questions. Basically, we looked at the characteristics of those who give unacceptable worships that we have the characteristics of apostates, which we looked at apostasy, apostasia, which just means falling away. Kind of like the Greek word, uh, a divorce of such, that there's a super, superficial kind of righteousness, superficial kind of spirituality, blatant iniquity, and a form of denial. And we kind of looked at that uh, he was impenitent, imp let's see, I still can't say it. I should have practiced like last week. Impenitent, there we go. Characteristics, uh, the doomed, that we can see them, that that is who they are, that they are, uh, they are thieves. They are, they are murderous, they are covetous, you know, it consumes them. It's, a, and it's just an, an obvious application, but they have no remorse, no, no nothing, and that's what we see in Cain. But we did uh, look at that they were certain that Cain was certainly not irreligious. That as a, hu as, as a people, we are, irre we are religious. We can't, we can't help it. We have to worship something, and as we looked at last week, you know, whether it's Moloch or uh, ourselves, you know, that, that time span to where from the beginning we're still sacrificing children. We're still, we're still doing these things that God does not want us to do, but we are going to do it in our, in our own way. And we saw that Abel brought the firstlings of his flock, and Cain brought something that reflected his own achievement, that he, uh, he did bring something to, to the Lord of his own accord, and it did not please the Lord. Abel's offering was accepted because the one offering was righteous. Abel was righteous. Because we, as we looked... Um, God had no or had regard for Cain or Abel. I'm sorry, for Abel and his offering. It was it was for both. He was he was righteous before the Lord, and he brought a righteous offering. Cain did not, and it, and it specifically points in there to look at both that Abel was righteous before the Lord, and his his offering was righteous and acceptable to the Lord. And Cain was wroth. I like that word. You could say angry, but uh, he was wroth. It just feels like this little extra, you know, oomph, you know, like, you gotta... and, and why was Cain wroth? Anybody? And that the fault was his own, and he wanted, he, he, he wanted to blame the Lord as well. And of course, yes, he thought his, his own works were good. He was not accepted. How, how dare, and how often do we do that? Like, how dare God not accept what we have given to him? That it not be good enough. That we, we did this thing, God should appreciate it no matter, no matter what it is. That you hear that in the 21st century. You heard it every century, but you're definitely hearing it now that God should accept me just for who I am, and and that's just the way it is, and that's kind of how Cain approached it. So we get to kind of see um, the, the the two dichotomies there, one versus the other. So and still God inquires, so He asks, and as we talked about last week. God didn't have to ask. God knew, but he asked anyways. And then why is it that he asks? Does anybody remember from last week? Anybody? <laughs> too many too many quizzes. <laughs> 
So he can see inside their heart, but the, he wants to know, he, he's giving him an opportunity to repent. He, the, the, the Lord is merciful, the Lord is gracious, and he wants to give an opportunity for him uh, to repent and, and, and come to him. But he's still, it's Cain, we know the story, unfortunately, we know how, how it unfolds. It's, it's, a, it's a tragic story, but God is still gracious and still mercy and gives us that example that if we are to come to him with a repentant heart, that he will, that we listen. And as fortunately, Cain did not. So there was a, a new quote that I, I, was, I was reading one of my books and I came across and I thought it was a good application for this. It's by Matthew Henry. The way of sin is downhill, and men go from bad to worse. Those who do not sacrifice well, but are careless and remiss in, our, in their devotion to God, expose themselves to the worst temptations, and perhaps the most scandalous sin lies at the door. Those who do not keep God's ordinances are in danger of committing all abominations. Interesting enough, Matthew Henry was actually said to be able to uh, read the Bible distinctly at three years old. I just thought that was interesting. I was not given that gift, but uh, so okay. Now we're on third, uh, the third week. So now we are getting to the portion of, well, I guess maybe we skipped over the heart a little bit. Then we knew Cain's heart was was wicked, that it was evil, that he had hatred and malice, and as Christ said in Matthew 5.21, that if, you, uh, if you're angry with the brother, that you murder in your heart. So essentially, Cain had really already committed the murder. He had, he had hated God, and he had hated Abel, and he had all that in his heart, but this week we get to look at the, the repercussions, the, the results of all that hate and anger and malice and, and, and loathing in his heart. So we'll read 4, 8. Cain told Abel his brother, and it came about when they were in the field that Cain rose up against Abel his brother and killed him. Then the Lord said to Cain, where is Abel, your brother? And he said, I do not know. Am I my brother's keeper? He said, what have you done? The voice of your brother's blood is crying to me from the ground. Now you are cursed from the ground, which has opened its mouth to receive your brother's blood from your hand. When you cultivate the ground, it will no longer yield its strength to you. You will be vagrant and a wanderer on the earth. Cain said to the Lord, my punishment is too great to bear. Behold, you have driven me this day from the face of the ground, and from your face I will be hidden. And I will be a vagrant and a wanderer on the earth, and whoever finds me will kill me. So the Lord said to him, Therefore, whoever kills Cain, vengeance will be taken on him sevenfold. And the Lord appointed a sign for Cain, so that no one finding him would slay him. Then Cain went out from the presence of the Lord and settled in the land of Nod east of Eden. So from this, just from the, from the get-go, we, we learn that we, we're not to hate our brother, that, that we are to love one another, and that he was not introducing a new, a new commandment but as he says in Leviticus 9.17, you shall not hate your brother in your heart, but you shall reason frankly with your neighbor, lest you incur sin because of him. And then we needed to look at who indeed is our brother. Most of us know, but obviously even in his time, people did not recognize who our brothers really are, which in Luke 10.36-37, the, the Lord said, which of these three do you think proved, obviously, let me, let me 
Let me go back a little bit. The parable of the Good Samaritan. This is the ending of that parable that he told about the Good Samaritan that, that helped. Is there anybody who doesn't know that story? Okay. Uh, so this is the end. I'm sorry. Do you think proved to be a neighbor to the man who fell among the robbers? He said, the one who showed him mercy. And Jesus said to him, you go and do likewise. So from this and, and many other passages, that our neighbors are, are everyone, that we are to love everyone as our neighbor. Which, as we can see, again, Cain did not. <laughs> uh, interesting story. There is a, there is a, he's a Jewish Influence in the news and everything. His name is Dennis Prager. Some of you may or may not have heard of him, but he's he's quite prevalent and he has uh, many talks and he has involvement with many, many people. And I was watching one of the talks that he had the other day, and I found it interesting. He was he was going over this, so he has this. He claims to have this Jewish mindset that he that he typically upholds. Uh, the Jewish rules, but it was interesting when he was talking that he made it a point to all of them, and a lot of them concurred, that there was a distinction between the hatred in your heart and the result of it. That it was a sin to do these things, but not to have it in your heart. He was a large proponent that it was like pornography was okay, as long as it didn't result an infidelity that you know that you could hate as long as you didn't murder and he just kept going on in the list it was I guess in today's society with Christian values that you know being built on a Judeo-Christian you kind of don't think about that because I think we've come to kind of accept that to a point but seeing so many of these individuals that are starting to, to, to believe this to disconnect that thing that we can separate, as we see in Cain, that, that evil heart, as long as we do not produce anything, it's okay. And I think that's one of the interesting things here. It, it clearly points out, uh, just going back in the, the Old Testament, not even getting to Jesus Christ, that that is not, that is not the case. Because we nurse grudges and we dwell on lustful images and we covet the blessings of others. And the end, the, the list, unfortunately, is endless. So in Genesis 4 8, the, it tells us that Cain spoke to Abel. Probably, you know, from the sounds of it, to possibly entice him out to the location, uh, likely in a field where you could probably guess it's possibly to you know, prevent somebody from coming to his aid that he uh, as it says in Deuteronomy 22 25 and while Cain has a lot of the firsts I wanted to look at a couple of Abel's firsts so Abel was the first saint, or first to die as a saint. He's the first human that died and went to heaven. He's the first that dies a martyr, and he's the first that dies for his religion. Martyr, parado. So I wanted to touch on the, the hopeful aspect of it too. We, we, we dwell on Cain and the evil and the, and, and the heart, but that the good things that even though, as we see here, Cain killing his brother, there are, there are good things. That we don't really think about Abel, that, that he was faithful, that he, he died for his righteousness, that while he was brutally murdered, he was vindicated and, and, and God watched over him. So interestingly enough, we were talking uh, at man camp about the crowns. And one of the ones came up as I was looking at it, uh, the crown of life. 
that we are faithful unto death. As it says in James 1, 12, Blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trial, for when he has stood the test of time, he will receive the crown of life, which God has promised to those who love him. And Cain died for his righteousness. Did you have anything uh, about the crown of life that maybe... crown which is uh, actually with the the greek is more of the well it, it, it's the crown but also the wreath of you know that the people were that's finished a race So with the crowns, they're, they're extra then, but we remember that in Christ that, that we win, that, that we need to ask as for his wisdom without doubting that we can't save ourselves and it's only by, by the sovereign grace of God that we can come to him. But these are rewards, not, not to be not to lift us up or of our own merit, but that we serve the, the Lord uh, rightly and justly, and as he, he, has, he has told us to. He also said that it's honorable and glorious to those who die for him. Oh, there's a little, there's a little Greek that we went over. So also, it made me think of in that thing, or in that verse, 1 Peter 4, 12 through 13. Beloved, do not be surprised at the fire travel when it comes upon you to test you, as though something strange were happening to you, but rejoice in as far as you share Christ's sufferings, that you may also rejoice and be glad when his glory is revealed. So we think of Cain, but then if we look throughout history, Cain was the first, but he definitely was not going to be the last, by far. Uh, it was going to get worse. It was going to, hopefully his was sudden, and it was the end. But going forward, we see that the unrighteous and the righteous, that the righteous fall at the hands. We're kind of sheltered here. We don't have to 
really see that or endure that. We hear things from far off countries that have to, but that's why I find it um, great to read of our brethren of the past that went through these things to know that our trials are really, I mean, our trials are our trials, but they're nothing a lot of times compared with some of our, our, our fallen brothers. The one that came to, to mind, so there's a, a, a volume, a four volume set of different martyrs that have suffered at the hands of people throughout history. It's, it's a big volume set. And I just thought I'd read the first one that was in that volume that was under Nero in 67 AD. It's from the Fox's Book of Martyrs. The first persecution of the church took place in the year 67 under Nero, the sixth emperor, emperor of Rome. This monarch resigned for the space of five years with tolerable credit to himself, but then gave way to the greatest extravagancy of temper and to the most atrocious barbarities. Among other diabolical whims, he ordered that the city of Rome should be set on fire, which, which order was executed by his officer, guards, and servants. While the imperial song of the burning of Troy and openly declaring he wished the ruin of all things before his death, besides the noble pile called Lacerus, many other places, palaces, and houses were consumed. Several thousand perished in the flames, were smothered in the smoke, or buried beneath the ruins. And then he upped his game. The dreadful conflagration continued nine days when Nero, finding that his conduct was greatly blamed and a severe odium cast upon him, determined to lay the whole upon the Christians at once to ex excuse himself and have an opportunity of glutting his sight with new cruelties. This was the occasion of the first persecution and the barbarities exercised on the Christians were such even excited the commiseration of the Romans themselves. Nero, the most infernal imagination could design. In particular, he had some sewn up in the skins of wild beasts and then worried by dogs until they expired and others dressed in shirts made stiff with wax, fixed to axle trees and set on fire in his gardens in order to illuminate them. This persecution was general throughout the Roman, whole Roman empire, but it rather increased than diminished the spirit of Christianity. In the course of it, St. Paul and St. Peter were martyred. So you can, you can see that, I'm sure we've heard of it, but it, it's, I don't know, it's something to, to read it, to really to reflect, you know, that you're using Christians as luminaries for your garden parties or the other atrocities that my mind can actually go to, thankfully, because uh, I do not have that mind or I have not, I have not heard of them. Is there any other stories that... Uh, Anybody knows that, that they might have heard? What do you think of all the martyrs that were you know, under the chain for their uh, you know, the years in church persecuting some of the so-called heretics at the time? And, you know, and for people to, they could have backed down. You just say, don't believe it, you, we'll let you off. And, but they don't because of their conviction. And, uh, I don't know why we have that kind of conviction. We, we say we would. 
you mean as far as trials to, to, to build yeah. us up, give us a... Right. Well, it produces character, as it says, character, steadfastness, as it, as it says, that it, it's a progression that we... No, although it's funny, my, in my lifetime, I didn't think we would get this close. <laughs> Which means if we put that in comparison, we should do we should do it all the more. That by recognizing that 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 we should be that it should strengthen us to know that even when we speak, that that is a a, a benefit that we have that our other brothers and sisters in Christ never never had. Which actually plays in and ends perfectly with a with a with a quote from my my many readings. And I found this one to be uh, quite encouraging. It's by Charles Spurgeon. First, I cannot be Christ's disciple unless I do this. And oh, I must be his disciple. He is such a master that I must follow him, such a Lord that I cannot but serve him. And if his service would involve the carrying of the cross, I say, welcome cross. Lord, put it on my back. I would gladly bear the burden which goes with his service. Let each one of us encourage himself with the next reflection. Better people than I am have carried a heavier cross than I have to carry. I know, dear sisters and brothers, that your cup is one of particular bitterness. But there are some who have drunk a far bitterer cup than yours, and they were better people than you are. Think of them. I have alluded to them already, the noble army of martyrs and sufferers for Christ's sake. I guess with that...